Okay. Hello, uh, hi everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. It's a, a pleasure and honor to host you again with Sebastian uh, from Heriot Watt uh, and myself from TU Delft uh, again this week, uh, having you all for a geoscience and geoenergy webinar. Today is 19th of August, in the case you forgot which day was it. It's Thursday still. So, uh, but time is different, of course, depending where you are connecting with us. Today, we have a great pleasure and honor to host uh, Professor Jenny Sukale from Stanford University. Jenny is Professor of Geophysics and by courtesy affiliated with the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment, Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence, as well as Institute for Computational and Mathematical Engineering, ICME. Jenny's research uh, focuses on understanding disaster risk and resilience. She approaches this challenge both from a fundamental point of view, by advancing our understanding of the processes that govern extreme events in different natural systems, and from an applied view, uh, applied point of view, by working with private and public partners to increase community resilience using a scientific co-production approach. Her research group specializes in the development of customized mathematical models that are testable against observational data from a broad spectrum of scales. Her current research priorities span natural hazards like volcanic eruptions, climate hazards such as ice sheet instability and uh, permafrost disintegration and hazards that arise from the interaction between natural processes and human interventions, such as flooding in urban areas and induced earthquakes. We all remember the German floods. Uh, just recently in Germany, we had a, a kind of a, a, a very severe flood as well. And our last speaker also, again, also mentioned that, that he witnessed this flood also recently in, her, in his uh, trip to Germany. She has received several honors and awards. I'm not gonna list all of them uh, to you, uh, but uh, especially she has been recently awarded the Presidential Early Career Awards for scientists and engineers, the highest honor bestowed by the United States government on science and engineering professionals in the early stages of their independent research careers. She has also received uh, several awards from the German National Merit Foundation. In the past, she has been a research fellow of Seismic Hazards with German Research Center for Geosciences, GFC, and French Natural National Research Institute for Sustainable Development, IRD. She holds a PhD in geophysics from MIT in 2011, she did her master's studies in public administration at Harvard University Kennedy School of Government. That's quite a change, Jenny. It's <laughs> quite impressive, I would say. I didn't expect this, really. <laughs> <laughs> That's the she, trick when I'm reading bios at the beginning. I mean, why? Time. I mean, why? <laughs> yeah, my, um, I also have a master's in theoretical physics from the Free University of Berlin. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly the next line. That, that, yeah, that's what she holds. <laughs> now, here's the backstory. I wrote my master thesis on a bunch of experiment in high temperature superconductivity. And after working on this for a year, it turned out the experiments were fake. All <laughs> wow. the data that I had worked on was completely wow. made up. And wow. so I was kind of done with that field. <laughs> <laughs> at that point. So I actually worked for the United Nations in disaster management for wow. a couple of years. And that actually got me hooked on earth science. So I'm very happy and retrospected I ended up that way. It was good for me. Um, <laughs> but after working for the UN for a couple of years, I went back to the Kennedy School just to kind of understand why it was so hard to actually use science to make a difference in the world, oh, because it yeah. was hard. And so, sure. so that's where the master's comes from. It's, oh. um, it was kind of like a, a way of, of making sense of my UN years. But oh, then wow. I saw the light and went back to geophysics. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's very impressive, by the way. So uh, as we just mentioned as well, she holds a, a master degree also from Free University of Berlin in Germany in physics as well with distinction. So it's our, our 
uh, true pleasure and honor to host you this week, uh, Jenny. Thank you very much for graciously accepting to give a lecture today. Uh, to the audience, please note uh, Jenny's lecture will last for about half an hour and then followed by questions. Like always, please do type your questions in the chat box and then we will uh, take them after the lecture. Uh, do not wait until the end of the talk to post your questions. Whenever you feel appropriate, please do type them. They may trigger other questions by the other audience as well. So without any further ado, uh, the stage bandwidth screen is all yours, Jenny. We are all looking forward to hearing your lecture. Thank you again. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction. I appreciate it. And it's great to be here. So thanks for joining. I wish I could see more of you, but, but here's a virtual wave into the ether. Um, thanks for joining. It's my pleasure to, to be here today and, and present um, some of our work. And I will focus specifically on induced seismicity. But before I do that, I just wanted to give you a bit of a sense of like what my group does and why we take that approach. So as Hadi already uh, mentioned, I'm a theoretical physicist by training. And theoretical physicists are wired to kind of look for fundamental processes that are common for different systems. So things might look very different. But I think one of the powers of physics is to see the commonality in things that might seem very different. And as I already mentioned, too, I came into earth science through my work for the UN and through thinking about natural disasters and the impact that they pose on communities. And I felt like that was such an exciting problem and exactly what I wanted to spend the rest of my life doing, because I think it's to me, it's the perfect blend of a really interesting physics problem. Like it's, it's really, if you want plain vanilla physics, so you need mass, momentum, energy conservation. And out of these three equations emerges this incredible, mind-blowing complexity and beauty. Um, but also, it's, it's so challenging to understand, and it's challenging to make that understanding actionable. So our work focuses, broadly speaking, on understanding natural disasters, why they happen, what makes a volcano erupt after it sits seemingly inactive for like centuries, or why, why are ice sheets behaving so differently than we thought they would? Why are water injections um, causing all of these earthquakes and how can we manage that risks? And, and how can we make sure that the climate impacts in the Arctic um, that are creating you know, all sorts of disruptions at the moment don't um, like in, affect communities in, in a way that, that they can still continue um, their livelihoods? So one of the aspects, like one of the ways we approach that is to sort of understand the common physical process. And I think one process that is at the heart of all of these extremes is the flow to sliding transition. Like material can deform internally and slowly through flow or can suddenly form an interface and just slide along that interface. So that is what we're doing. And we're trying to understand that from a multi-scale modeling point of view. And then we're applying that to, to understanding different systems and, and reducing the risks that they pose. So typically we categorize in our science, we categorize things as either fracture or flow. So for example, fracture would be the San Andreas fault. But when you look very closely into the system, you'll see that there's really more to it, right? Like there is fracture, but there's also creep and there's also fluids of the fault zone. And, and obviously the induced seismicity, that is where a lot of the quote unquote drama comes from. So it is a fracture system, but it also exhibits flow properties. And then on the other hand, for example, in, in volcanic eruption, we think of it as a flow and it looks like a flow once you have the lava at the surface. But we also have eruption speeds of hundreds of uh, meters per second. So sorry, there's a typo on the slide should be 100 meters per second. So that's the speed of like a race car, right? So like that's very, very fast for a highly viscous fluid. So I guess my thought on this is I think most natural systems really do a blend of both. They look at how fracture and flow are interacting. And, and that poses some unique modeling challenges because the equations you would ordinarily write down to do one or the other process are quite different. So how can we think about merging these two? And, and today I wanna to present our work on induced seismicity where we kind of take a specific approach to how to blend these two really rather fundamentally different behaviors. And before I do that, I just want to give you a little primer on how I think about models, right? So as I already said, I'm a theoretical physicist. And as a theoretical physicist, the approach to modeling that you're introduced to in your studies is basically this. You have the real world and you have some system you want to understand in the real world. So for example, a pendulum. And then you transfer that to the conceptual world with a very long list of assumptions, 
right? So, so you can have like, you know, like it, it seems like such an obvious thing, but even sort of this conceptual model of a pendulum in theoretical physics is highly idealized, right? Like the, the string can't bend, the mass is a point, you know, like you cannot look at too large angles. So that's a long list of assumptions. Now, how does that work for the real world? Like, how do I take something like Earth and then write a model, right? Like that is what, to me, what modeling is. It's really about this transition to the conceptual world. How on earth do I do that, right? Like, where do I start? I have a variety of scales, I have a variety of systems, most of them are coupled. Like, how do I approach this? And I think um, there is a lot of guidance on this, but I also think models, or at least our approach to modeling is to really write one model for each problem. So we're not a group that develops community models in that sense, where the idea is that I represent a specific system. The goal is that I develop a model for one particular problem. And I have some guidance on this. And most importantly, I feel like there are four pieces of guidance. One question is, what am I trying to achieve with the model? Like, what is the goal of my model? The second question is, what is the scale you want to focus on? Do you want to do this at the granular scale? Do you want to do it at the scale of a earthquake in a phase? Do you want to do it at a much larger scale, like say a whole, whole field or maybe a whole region? Then I think very crucially important in how we design models is the question of what data are we using? Like, how can we test the model? What kind of data can we test this model against? And the data often gives some guidance on the scale that is relevant. And then finally, in our science, we obviously stand on the shoulder of giants, right? Like we have centuries of physics and chemistry and biology and all of these prior fields to build on, but, but we need to pick that information in a meaningful way. So I want to walk you through how I approach model development for the case of induced seismicity by kind of looking at these four dimensions of how to develop a model. And that also to me suggests that, you know, models are not really realistic or not. I think they're never realistic, but they, they, they can be useful for answering one particular question or challenge. So let's do this. So the goal in many of our studies, as I already said, is understanding disaster risk. So here is a map uh, from one of my colleagues here at Stanford, Bill Ellsworth, that looks at um, the risk from natural and induced earthquakes. And you can see um, the red blob around Oklahoma City standing out and being at a similar level as we are here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And if you've never thought about the earthquake risk in, US, in the US, that might not seem like such a surprising finding. But when you keep in mind that, you know, like the San Andreas Fault is one of the most active faults in the world, one of the most dangerous faults in the world. And Oklahoma really didn't have many earthquakes prior to like 2008, maybe, or 2010. So here is a compilation of the Oklahoma earthquakes magnitude three or greater. And you can see that this, the, the, the intensity of, of seismic activity in Oklahoma is really quite a recent phenomenon. So, so that's why sort of the fact that Oklahoma is now on par with California in terms of seismic risk, and in fact has more earthquakes, magnitude three or greater, and has had more earthquakes in the last couple of years, is quite astonishing, right? So in this project, what we're trying to do very broadly speaking is understand risk, understand how risk is changing. So contrary to how we typically think about seismic risk in the context of tectonic earthquakes, the risk imposed by new seismicity is changing over time, it's evolving. So how can we integrate that into our framework? And then finally, how can we reduce or manage that risk? And so today I wanna to show you two examples that we worked on, which is um, two different um, hydrocarbon fields, Guy Greenbrier in Arkansas, and then Groningen in the Netherlands. And um, I wanna emphasize that really a lot of this work and a lot of the intellectual input from this comes from my wonderful previous postdoc, David Dempsey, who is now a faculty um, in New Zealand. So just want to acknowledge his contribution to this. And it's been a really wonderful journey that, that David and I had together, but, but a lot of this is his work. So let me start with Guy Greenbeer, or like, let me, let me start with sort of thinking about, so we, we identified our goal. We said, oh, we want to understand risk. We want to understand how we can, how it's, how it's evolving and how we can manage it. So now let's look at the scale of the data. At what scale do we want to develop our model? And I would argue when it comes to the goal of understanding risk, I think there's a true value in looking at not a single earthquake, not a single event, but an entire sequence. 
So why is that? Why is it useful to look at earthquake sequences? I think one aspect is that collective properties average out some of the uncertainty. So seismicity rate tells you more than just a single earthquake. It tells you how things are changing. It tells you how, um, how frequent certain magnitudes are. And we know that if we have lots of small earthquakes, you know, like eventually you'll get some bigger ones as well. And they also give you sort of hints at what's happening physically. So, for example, there's a time offset in, in many fields that experience induced seismicity. For example, you see that on the top right here in the, in the slide, where the earthquakes really lag the injection um, by a couple of months, right? So that's interesting. So it's not an immediate one-on-one -on -one connection. We can derive statistical properties. We can, we can, you know, actually fit. We can compute B values. We can um, understand the statistical behavior. Then there also is often spatial migration. So, for example, in some of these um, earthquake sequences, the induced seismicity was really propagating along fault, gradually sort of lighting up different aspects of the fault. Um, and then there's, of course, the problem of intensification, which I can tell from a sequence, but I can't really tell from a single event. So for the purpose of risk, I think scale, the scale is really a uh, field scale and the data we want to understand is the entire sequence. That means we cannot identify whether one particular event was induced or not. And that's often important for legal purposes. But I think from a scientific point of view, I think the sequence um, it, it sheds more light on, on sort of the importance of the production element and how different production scenarios create different levels of risk. So let's start with Guy Greenbrier and more generally with this goal of quantifying the risk of injection induced seismicity. And of course, injections induced seismicity, the basic idea is the more I inject, the more I increase the pore pressure at a fault, and that makes the fault slippery. So I will expect to see more earthquakes. But what's surprising when you look at this data, so this is for Oklahoma, um, and again, colleagues from Stanford compiled this figure. Um, and it shows you injection rate in millions of barrels. So one barrel is 10 to the 8 liter. So when you look at this, you can see just how much water is being pumped down there. And you can also see that we again see this lag of earthquakes, right? So like initially, there were way fewer, but then in the last couple of years, these have um, ticked up quite a bit. So then we need to think about in the, in the design of our models, what is it that we build on? Like, again, what are the, the shoulders of the giants we can stand on? And I think for this particular point of view, there are really two pathways. We have huge reservoir models um, that can help us understand if I have an injection well and if pressure plume propagating, how does that affect the fault and how does that affect the earthquakes on the fault? So that's what I categorize here as a quasi-dynamic model. But we also have much simpler models. So this is um, a model by a pioneer or an idea pioneered by Jim Rice, um, who I did my postdoc with, where basically he takes the point of view that, you know, you can do this, the fundamentals of earthquake magnitudes really in a very simple framework. If I just look at a 1D fault line and I have some fault stress on it, so the wiggly line you see is the stress on the fault. Um, and if I then have, like sometimes, you know, when I create a new interface, I gain energy. So that's what's shown here in green, the energy source. I release energy. For example, I release stored strain. Sometimes I need to create energy. I need to invest energy to create this interface. Like I need to actually create a new fracture for the correct to propagate. So Jim really suggested to, and, and that's, you know, like a while back now, this paper suggested that very simply speaking, I can really understand the, um, the, the size of the earthquake rupture through an energy balance. I'm balancing the energy that is being released with the energy that is being invested. And one of the key advantages of that is that this is vastly faster. So this is basically a semi-analytic way of understanding what is sort of the, the slip extent or the rupture extent of a particular earthquake. And the advantage of that is if I do this, um, I don't need to run an hourly simulation or hour long simulation. I can do everything really in basically in a heartbeat. And I would argue it gives you everything you need, right? So like we, as I said, our goal is to assess risk and the key aspect of risk is just magnitude. So really all we need for risk is magnitude. I don't need to understand how the seismic energy is propagating, right? So I do not have 
slip evolution here. I don't have the seismic waves. I don't have the entire um, the entire complexity of the problem. I've really reduced it down to just the, the, the challenge of understanding magnitudes. But for the purpose of risk, I think that is really what we want. And the advantage of having this very quick simulation is I can basically do this for a huge assemblage of fault, faults with various different properties. And then again, I can derive statistical properties from the synthetic earthquake catalog that you've created. So how does that work? We still need to link this fracture idea. So I think the quasi-static model gives you a sense of how we model fracture, but we still need to link that to the flow. So here's where the flow comes in. So in the case of Guy Greenbeer, we actually calculate the pressure evolution from one of these reservoir models. We have an injection well and have an aquifer where the water is spreading. And this aquifer then le leaks into a connected fault. And that means that um, the fault pressure is changing over time. And then I apply this. So the blue lines on top are basically being fed into the model at the bottom. And from that, I can estimate the rupture extent um, just through the energy balance I just described. Now, the advantage of this kind of approach, which might seem very simple at first, and it is really quite simple, is that I can do hundreds of thousands of different realizations of this. Obviously, I don't know the stress on the fault exactly, um, and I don't know all of some of the other um, um, some of the other parameters like the stress pass coefficient, like I don't know, there are several parameters that I don't know and will never know. So our approach here is by doing a, like a large number of simulations, I can just sort of create a probabilistic distribution and really quantitatively assess uncertainty. So how does that, what, what, how is this model, what, what, what is the value of this model? What can this kind of model help me do? So here is the Guy Greenbrier sequence. And if you look at the top left for a second here, you can see that um, there are two wells that we focus on primarily. Um, and they're both kind of relatively close to this fault line that is gradually being illuminated by, by the seismicity. And one of the challenges in Guy, Guy Greenbrier was that the magnitudes both increased in numbers, but also in magnitude, right? So like they started to see 3.6s and there was real worry um, that, you know, like there, there could be a very significant event in the range of like five maybe um, happening in this field. So as the seismicity rate in, like continued to increase, um, the injection was stopped and the injection in the entire field was stopped. And that is of course sort of one, one way of just managing risk. But also, I think it's important to keep in mind that for operators, I think the real goal is to find a way to operate a field safely. And shutting down everything means a lot of investments lost in, in economic you know, revenue for the community, lost in, in sort of other ramifications, which um, are important to think carefully about. And so what I think this model shows quite clearly is that not the two welds did not have the same impact on seismicity. So if you look at the table at the bottom, our model would suggest that, well, one is really mostly to blame for the seismicity. So 81% of the events in our synthetic catalog are really related to the injection at well one, not necessarily well five, right? So like well five in comparison only has is sort of quote unquote responsible for 19% of the events. And I should say that this country, this attribution is really a probabilistic one. Like I cannot say for one particular earthquake, this was caused by well one, but I can say if I compare the synthetic catalogs for um, in for, for operation at the two wells, I can, the, the, the two catalogs would be distinctly different. So I think um, this kind of framework can be useful for managing the risk related to injection a bit more thoughtfully. So maybe not shutting down everything, but also not just operating as if nothing has ever happened, but instead thinking carefully about which well is creating some of the seismicity we see and how can we maybe reduce injection at that well, maybe inject another well. So like how can we um, manage the operations of the field in a way that we are thoughtful about the economic constraints, but also thoughtful about the risk that is being produced. So this was um, one, like this is just one um, application of our, of our model and, and something that, you know, like 
the industry was uh, quite interested in. But there's other challenges with hydrocarbon production. It's not all about injection. So here is sort of the second example I want to present to you. And it's basically the same model framework. And, and, and I think that's why I wanted to present those two examples, because I think it's interesting to see how if you build your model from sort of individual pieces, then you can actually just arrange these pieces to look at a different example. So here is um, the earthquake sequence at Groningen. So Groningen is, is a gas field in the Netherlands operated by Shell and NAM. And it's a huge field and, and a huge uh, driver of, of economic revenue. But unfortunately, the earthquake started to increase quite notably. So in, if you look at the left of your screen here, you can see the little red dots are the earthquakes and the blue outlines are sort of the, the field from which most of the production arised. Um, most of the production was um, was fed. But in this case, there was no injection necessarily, but really it was a, an effect of drawdown. So the more there was produced, the more hydrocarbon was extracted, the more the reservoir basically contracted. Um, and that's sort of something that, you know, others have looked at. So for example, Siegel and Fitzgerald has a derived an analytical model for what this drawdown, how this drawdown stresses nearby faults. And that is what we're building on here. So again, we're standing on the shoulder of giants. We're just kind of compiling the pieces in a way that um, helps us answer the question we're interested in. Now, I should say that like some of the magnitudes here, and often when you talk about induced seismicity, the magnitudes are not as big as we are used to sometimes in the tectonic context. So we don't, we're not going to see sixes and sevens here in terms of magnitude. But it's useful to keep in mind that many of these areas where induced seismicity is common don't actually have many seismic risk regulations. So even a relatively small earthquake, like a three or four, can actually create a, a rather significant damage. And, and that is what happened at Roningen, and that is sort of what created the public pushback against the operations of this field. And as a consequence, Shell assembled this workshop to identify um, what is the maximum magnitude that can um, that can be that can be induced or triggered through um, through hydrocarbon production at Groningen, and that's sort of what motivated this work. So, how can we apply our model here? Again, we're going to start with the data. So, the data is both regarding the tectonic stress state; it's an extensional stress state. Um, then we can infer sort of the initial stress on faults. We have a map of some of the faults in the field. Obviously, many faults are unknown, but we can we can use that. And then we combine that with a model for how the poroelastic stress changes that are related to production change the stress on the fault and combine that to into a fracture mechanics model very similar to the one that we've done for Guy Greenbrier. So that what that fracture mechanics model looks like. Um, the bottom should look familiar. So we're doing the same estimation of rupture and extent by balancing energy. But the step one is different because we're not dealing with injection now. We're dealing with the pressure decline. And we're trying to understand how that changes the likelihood of the faults to a fracture or to rupture. And then we calibrate this model. So um, we use the earthquake data that is shown on the left. So the Turquoise and pink dots are um, earthquake locations, and the dots are indicative of the magnitude. You can see, as I said, the magnitude are not huge. Um, and then we use that to basically train the model. So there's a part of the data that is basically training data. And then there's a part of the model where, after we've trained the model, we try to project it forward. So it's really a forecast, kind of like a weather forecast. This is sort of a seismicity forecast. And on the right-hand side, you see these three colors, so the purple, the orange, and the turquoise. These are three different production scenarios um, that were considered for safe operation of this field. Um, and you can see that they, they give a rather different sort of number of events. So what we're plotting on, I mean, you look at the plot on the right-hand side, so that's plot number F. The number of earthquakes really depends quite sensitively on these three production levels. And, and that was, uh, and you can see also when you look on the right that when the production was stopped, right, so that's sort of the relatively steep decline in earthquakes, um, that's because of safety concerns raised by the community about the increasing earthquake numbers of Coronian. But our model also suggested that if you now resume production, you will, you will still have earthquakes in the field. Um, and they, they can be 
somewhat large, but um, our projection was to have um, a maximum momentum magnitude in the range of maybe four, the, like up to four, 4.1, 4.2 in that range. I should say that our model is really based, because it is based on the past earthquake catalog, it does not allow for fundamentally new behavior. So for example, in Groningen, there was concern about the number of earthquakes eventually fracturing the crystalline basement underneath the reservoir. And that sort of, that stores tectonic stress from like, you know, uh, million years past, right? So like that could potentially then lead to a much more significant event. So that's not something we're considering here. So the, the maximum magnitude here is really based on seismic behavior that is in principle similar to what happened in the past. And that's an important limitation of the model. So our forecast of felt earthquakes at maximum magnitude, both of these are concerns when it comes to managing fields. The number of felt events is, is important because it, it sort of creates a, a perception of, of danger for the community. And it gives you a sense of like, you know, how much you're reactivating and how much you're releasing all of the store tectonic stresses. Um, and one of the conclusions here is that the number of felt events depends maybe a bit more sensitively on the production scenario than the maximum magnitude. So if you look on the right hand side, the maximum magnitude is actually not that different um, for the three production scenarios, but the number of felt events could be. And again, I think this is with the caveat that should the crystalline basement underneath fracture, that's, um, that's, that is a possibility, but, but it's not something that we specifically, that our model is specifically sort of trained to look at. Our model is really trained to look at these different production scenarios, assuming that the reservoir per se remains intact. So let me summarize and conclude, um, because I really do want to leave enough time for questions, and I'm curious to hear from you. So the kinds of probabilistic approaches that I've presented, I think can be really valuable for quantifying evolving seismic risk, right? So like one fundamental difference between how we traditionally assess seismic risk for tectonic earthquakes and how we assess seismic risk for induced earthquakes is that for induced earthquake, the risk is constantly changing and it's actually dependent on management. So there's a close link between sort of how I operate a field and how I and, and how much earthquakes are, are generated. So I think it's important to link those two as we have done in our model. So that's really, I think the key contribution of our model is to link those two components, but link those two components in a probabilistic framework. So traditionally, if I look at tectonic risk, I would basically just look at the size of the, the earthquake catalog and derive statistics from that, assuming that it won't change, which makes sense in a tectonic setting, but less sense here. And then finally, we can use these approaches to guide management. We can use these approaches to, um, to sort of manage the risk that, that is associated with hydrocarbon production. And then finally, and this is slightly a slightly more subtle point, probabilistic models really are living models, right? And that's very important to keep in mind because they are trained on past data. They are only as good as the data you put in and they need require they, they require constant updating so just like I, I really think of this earthquake forecasting that we're doing here in a similar way as a weather forecast right like in a weather forecast you would constantly update your model with the most recent weather data and i think the same is required here so as i that's why i'm motivated how we derive our model like the goal is not to have a perfect description of what happens in these fields because there's a lot of uncertainty around that our goal is to quantify the evolving risk and guide the management approaches. And if we want to do that, you would have to constantly update the model with new data to see how this risk is evolving and, the degree, and evaluate the degree to which different management, management approaches actually impact the seismicity rate or not. So these models are meant to live and to grow. And with that, I want to... Thank you for your attention and um, end on this quote from Einstein, which I really like. Everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler, which I think is sort of our approach to modeling. I'm a big fan of simple models. Um, I think they are easier to understand. They are easier to analyze. They're easier to, it's easier to see the faults and the, the issues in them. Um, but it's important to, you know, Make, don't, not make it too simple, right? And I think um, the, the probabilistic lens can really help 
quantify some of that uncertainty. Um, all of our codes are available open source um, on our GitLab rep repositories. And I also want to thank our sponsors um, for supporting our research. Thank you so much for your attention. OK, thank you very much. Uh, let me bring us back again to the screen. Uh, thanks very much for this fascinating talk. Uh, it's quite, uh, I would say, not so easy to uh, make the problem simple as well. It's, it's a lot more challenging. So to just that's more from my own experience. So uh, we see questions are being posted. Uh, so I, I give the floor uh, to Sebastian to take them. And uh, we hold the question and answering session now. Yes, um, thank you also very much from my side, Jenny, for, for a great talk. And if you use the quote, the Einstein quote myself a lot when I teach, and, and the other ones, all models are wrong, um, some, some are useful from George right. Fox. Um, before I pass on, I use my, my, my um, chair of the question answer session to sneak in my, my own question first. There's a really interesting philosophical um, question here. And some of the comments in the in the chat point to this. Your model allows us to look at huge parameter spaces very quickly because there are a lot of things we just can't measure, and the model should be always as complex as the question we ask and the data that we have available. But how do we actually know that our models are not too simple? Um, there's a lot of discussions of in the past in the oil and gas industry where these top-down or bottom-up models build something very coarse, very quickly, huge parameter spaces. But you may be missing a really important bit of the physics that just drives these extreme events and cause these excursions that then are million dollars, billion dollars damage, be it an earthquake, a leaking well, et cetera. So how, how do we know how simple is enough and when we get too simple? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and something that we, we think about a lot, because as you say, it's particularly important for extreme events, right? Because I, I'm really looking at, like I'm, I'm looking at the black swans, right? Like I'm interested in the yeah. black swans. I'm interested in these sort of special cases. And I think the answer in my mind there is, I think no single model can help you do everything that you want to do, right? So I think for me, this model was really sort of trying to get at, given the behavior that we see, how would this behavior affect it? How would how would this behavior be affected by other management approaches or like different sort of production scenarios, right? It does not assess the question of, you know, how about the crystalline basement? How about a more significant sort of event that fractures the crystalline basement? Because that would be kind of the black swan scenario here, right? And I think for that, you would need a separate model. And I think that's, I think to me, the way I think about the models and their value is fundamentally like a puzzle, right? Like each model gives you one piece and I don't think it's necessarily fair to say, oh, this model is better than the other model. I think yeah. they're really complementary, right? Like if I want to understand that full complexity and, and maybe understand sort of that, the possibility of one event that would be very different and, and very destructive potentially, I think it's valuable to write a separate model for that. So, so my approach to this is, I think it's, it's really like, the, the question we ask of a model is such an important starting point, right? Like, I think there's really, that's really like, and, and it's something I try to constantly, you know, like convince my students of is the question you ask is actually more important than the answer that you give, right? Mm -hmm. Because that really governs what is the model you want to write. And I think if you are interested in one particular extreme event, I think it's useful to write a model specifically for that. And yes, it will still be uncertain, right? But that's where I think the living model idea comes in, where you kind of need to just update the model constantly and not pretend that you know. I think it's okay to not know. It's just like, it's what it is in earth science. I think we just often do not know. But then I think it's valuable to think about for your model, for example, how can I test the model? For example, is there a particular measurement that would really help test this? Is there a particular sort of data set that as it comes in more, maybe I'm learning more about that possibility. So um, so that's a lot, for example, of what we do when we work with field campaigns is really like how, what is the measurement that helps you best constrain a model? So so I think no model is ever a final answer. Um, I think it's, it's really meant to, to evolve with data and to evolve with other constraints, right? Like to evolve with other 
um, other efforts to, to look at a particular physical process. And some of our models are, you know, physically much more complicated than this. And, and I love them. And, and, and that's great if, if that's what I want to understand. Like, what is the probability of you know, like one of these weird behaviors pushing through or like realizing in the field? Um, but I think in this case, it, it, would, be, it, it would be entirely complementary to do that. It would be interesting to do that. But um, yeah, I think models kind of need, we need a family of models rather than a separate, mm -hmm. like a single one. Yeah, and, and there's an interesting, I'm going to come to the questions in, in one second. Mark Bentley, one of our previous speakers about a year ago, he said, he often says, well, one of the big problems of having big computers, you now we end up with two things we don't understand, which is the model itself, because it is so much physics, so much data, so much complexity, and actually the process that we want to study or the reservoir that we want to study. But enough from me. So um, you talked about sort of, you know, data sets um, and th that we can use for our models. and Yuan Wang, one of our very frequent listeners, um, Hi Yuan, ask, um, oh, that's the wrong question, sorry. Could you explain what are the parameters that need to be calibrated in the model, in the spe specific model that you showed? Yeah, so um, let me maybe go back. There are a variety of parameters, and I think it also goes back to um, your question earlier. So here are some of the parameters that we are calibrating. Um, there, there are a variety of parameters here. So there's the strath path coefficient, for example, in A, um, and, and there are like a variety of other parameters. I don't want to go through all of them in detail because I think the key point is, there's a, like you, it really, again, it depends on the model you write, but there's an infinite number of parameters if you want to, right? Like, like there's also the previous stress state on the fault and all sorts of things. And um, I think the, the calibration here, like some people, for example, get very excited about you know, particular posterior distributions that we derive here. But I think it's very important to keep in mind with these kinds of models that the posterior, so, th so the way we, we approach this is, so for example, if we don't know a particular parameter, like the stress path coefficient, we assume a uniform distribution as our prior because we don't know. So that just kind of says, oh, we don't know. And then we derive what the posterior distribution would be. But I think it's very important that there's not necessarily, there is some value in these posterior distributions, but it's also uh, confounding assumptions of the model with the data, right? So for example, like we are greatly simplifying our, our faults. We don't take, you know, like the angles into account. We don't take into account, you know, like how, um, how like we, we just assume there are linear lines and all of this. So I think the issue with these posterior distributions is they're really um, mingling together model assumptions and evidence from the data. So um, these parameters are, I think it's, it's interesting to show. And for example, one of the aspects here that you see is that the field was not critically stressed at the beginning of operations or else you would have seen uh, you know, an uptick of, of seismicity earlier. So there are some aspects of this which are quite interesting, but I think there are also like aspects of this which are really a reflection of the model. And I, I, I like the, the, the comment you added to that, Sebastian, which is, you know, like with these big computers, right? Like what are, there, there is always this temptation of just kind of handing the problem to the computer and just kind of giving it everything, just kind of like writing these sort of super comprehensive models. But then you have you're dramatically increasing the number of parameters, right? And so one of the things we're intentionally doing here with our relatively simplistic, simplistic quasi-static model is that we're reducing the number of parameters we need to assess, but that means we have assumptions in the model that we can't necessarily test, right? So for example, our, our, our faults are 1D, they're not 2D, they're not 3D as real faults would be, right? So, so the parameters, I would not get too, I would not over, I think there's a danger in over-interpreting some of these parameter mm -hmm. distributions because they really are not an independent measure of sorts. They really are very dependent on the model framework itself. Thank you. Um, you, so you mentioned how you simplify your model and your faults are surfaces and, and they don't have angle and the geoscientists um, immediately ask them that, I don't think Leda is, is it, I'm not sure if Leda is a geoscientist or reservoir engineer. Hardy, please, please set me straight here. Some, well, more geo, a reservoir engineer. More reservoir engineer. So, but she says, no, thank you for the inspiring. 
Sorry, but she has two years to defend her PhD, so that's Good. she will decide. So, <laughs> would heterogeneity of the reservoir play a significant role? Things like falls having different angles, properties being we know that geology is not perfectly uniform. So, how do we deal with heterogeneity in, in such situations? Or how do we know perhaps that heterogeneity doesn't matter? Yeah, so that's a, a great question. I actually like we spend a lot of time thinking about heterogeneity. So this is, you know, like right down my alley. And I think heterogeneity actually plays a really interesting role. I think sometimes it suppresses very simple instabilities, right? So like, for example, some sort of relatively simple fluid dynamical instabilities that we worry about, like, say, the Taylor Safman instability, they actually don't happen that much in a very heterogeneous medium, right? Because you just have so much noise that it doesn't average out a lot of that sort of unstable behavior, right? Like, so heterogeneity can both be stabilizing, but of course they can also be destabilizing because if I have a pre-existing zone of weakness or like a, a high, you know, like um, highly permeable zone that channels the water that can have huge impacts on, on where fracture happens and why. So, so heterogeneity is always, is always kind of the elephant in the room to me. And I think sometimes it's really important and sometimes it's not, <clears throat> sorry. But I think the key is um, for heterogeneity is can you actually do something about it, right? Like, do you know? It's not. I think it's not like no one can say is it important or is it not important. I feel like I cannot make that assessment. The question is, can I know about it or not know about it, right? And I think in the case of Groningen, I don't think I can know about it. Like, I mean, is the reservoir heterogeneous? Undoubtedly, it is, right? But but I don't think that's something that we can assess here, and so it's not something that we. Um, we can consider it, of course, in the sense that, you know, like some of the parameters we can assign are heterogeneous, but then the question is, what is the value added of that kind of level of complexity? Because then you're adding another parameter that governs how the parameter varies, right? So I think the, the short answer is, I think heterogeneity is almost always important. The question is, is it important for the question that you want to ask? Right? Like, is it relevant for the goal that you have? I think this is a very goal-oriented modeling approach. We don't attempt to represent the model in its full, the, the reservoir in its full complexity. We don't have the ambition to be realistic. And in fact, personally, I think it's never possible in Earth systems. I don't think you can represent any Earth system in a realistic way in a computer. It's just too complicated for that. It has too many scales and too many different possible behaviors. But I think what's important is to think about, is it, do I need heterogeneity to answer the question that I've posed? And I think in this case, I'm not so sure that I do. Um, and I don't know what the heterogeneity is. So that's why we, we really take sort of a very data-driven approach where, for example, I mean, even the Guy Greenbrier case, right? Like the data in some sense indicates heterogeneity, right? Like the, the Guy Greenbrier sequence really illuminates the fault line beautifully for you. And it tells you, oh, this is heterogeneity that's important because this is where all the seismicity happens. And so we kind of take the clue about heterogeneity purely from the data. Ideally, you would also have measurements that help you sort of back that up or like provide an independent constraint, but it's just not usually the case that we have that. Thank you. And I'm following up with another question from Yuan Wang. And going to sort of expand on this second. Um, so Yuang says, in your view, when would be the need for high fidelity models? And you explained very nicely, and I, I fully agree with the question, if heterogeneity matters, depends on the questions that you ask, but could we use high fidelity models to understand actually how wrong the simplified models are? So we, we get some bounds on, on the correctness of the model. So. So what is your role, in your view, what's the role of, of high fidelity models in that approach? Yeah, I think there is a lot, I think there's a huge role for high fidelity models. Um, for example, you know, like one of our, in one of our projects, we are looking, I think that the key value of high fidelity models is this allows you to connect to a data set that you ordinarily might not be able to connect to. So to kind of venture out of the space of induced seismicity for a second, for example, in volcanic eruptions, right? Like most of the data we have that help us understand what happened prior to the eruption are actually erupted samples, right? Like these had tiny little crystals with like bubbles entrained in them and like rims, um, really like at the micrometer scale. And these are really the only evidence we have 
for what happened prior to eruption, right? So there, I think you need a high fidelity model that allows you to understand, to, to kind of um, leverage that information, leverage the clues that are imprinted in these tiny little crystals, right? So there we are writing models at the crystalline scale and seeing, you know, like what, what could, like how, how would the flow, what kind of flow fields can create the signature, the observational signature we see in these crystals. So, so these are exceedingly, you know, like high fidelity because that's where the data is at. And if you want to understand, I think this really fine scale data, you need to understand the physics that happens at that scale. So I would argue like what, like what exactly is a high fidelity model? Again, I think depends on the data that you have and the mm -hmm. question that you ask, right? Like there's no, I think very good definition of like a low fidelity versus a high fidelity model, right? Like I think again, like to me, the whether a model is, you know, has enough fidelity really depends on, you know, what's the question and what's the data. And I think here the data is relatively like say coarse, right? Like we have these, I don't, for some of these earthquakes, I'm not even exactly sure what depth they're at, you know, like some of these magnitude ones and twos, they're not you know, like super well constrained. I don't know the rupture mechanism. There are many things I don't know. So if I have a relatively coarse data, I think it's better to have a relatively coarse model because the data and the model need to talk to each other. If I have really high fidelity data, like say I have a borehole that I've drilled in and I can look at, oh, what are the different layers and what are their permeabilities and porosities and all of that, then you can think about, oh, maybe let's write a more high fidelity model. But then of course you need to wrestle with the fact that this is one site measurement and maybe not indicative of the field as a whole, right? Like, so I think there's like, you have to die one death or another. Um, so I don't think there is, there is sort of a general answer to what you're asking. I think to me, the question is really what is sufficient fidelity for the problem that you're trying to address and for the data that you have to do that. Knowing when, yeah, knowing when, what the limitations of your model then are in the given circumstances. Sarah is asking a question again, I'm gonna add my own little comments on this apologies, but it's such a fascinating topic that I'm keen to ask my own question. So did, which approach is the best to make decisions based on does such a best approach exist? And the question that comes in, in, in uh, the, the, the additional comment after Sarah's question, I'm keen to hear you. You mentioned um, instead of passing, you're not looking at single events um, because that's sort of a risk assessment and insurance purpose, et cetera. That's it becomes important. So is there a view from, from the insurers, from oil field operator, from um, a city council that they say, well, that model is too simple or that model is too complex or is there like a certain requirement to a model such that we can make the best scientific decision at all so when we talk about risk and finances etc that the models are testable what are you, what is the best approach in that sense yeah that's a great question and, and something that you know i it, we uh, we think a lot about so i think it, it depends so um for one, I think the biggest mistake that I see is to kind of take a model for granted and think that it actually represents reality, which it never does. It just can't, right? And so I think that's why I'm really like emphasizing this living model idea. Like whatever model it is that you're running, you need to just realize that, you know, it needs to be evolving. It needs to evolve with more data. It needs to evolve with changing behavior. Like it's, it's really just like every model can only give you a snapshot or like one sort of snippet of the bigger picture, right? Like it's just one puzzle piece of a much bigger image. And I think the that's something that is hard, particularly for, I think, regulators to sort of wrap your head around. And, you know, like actually in the last year, because we, we uh, I, I run a community engaged initiative where we work with communities and we've um, recently done like some COVID modeling and sort of ventured into that space. And I think it's really interesting, like when you look at these models that are trained on data from 2019, and then you apply them to data from 2021, they're completely mismatched, right? Because so many things have changed, right? Like human behavior has changed, like the pandemic has changed, the virus has changed, so many things have changed. And I think that's so true for most models. Like I think the key is really sort of this living model approach. You need to monitor what's happening. You, have, you need to have a model that kind of gives you an indication of whether what how things are evolving is worrisome or not but i think sort of this idea that you can have like a very a model that gives you all the answers i think is just not realistic and i think that's the i think the 
biggest thing that I've learned is to just kind of work with partners, like rather than just kind of as a scientist, I think we sometimes have this idea, oh, I'm going to write this model. Someone is going to find it somewhere in sort of publication space, understand it, know what to do with it, be in a position to do something about it, have the funding to do that, et cetera, et cetera. And then great things will happen. Right. But, but that kind of logical chain is really kind of fragile. Right? Like there's so many things that need to happen for that to actually be the case. Right. So I think our approach there is to work very closely with decision makers and understand what are they struggling with? What is the question that they want to pose? And then write a model that we constantly update with that kind of provides guidance on how to make certain decisions. And I think that's, that's important. I think models are very powerful. I, you know, I think they, they can really identify opportunities that are not necessarily intuitive, right? Like what, how do you want to intervene and in which way do you want to intervene? But I think the big risk is to take them too seriously, to take them as too mm -hmm. permanent, too monolithic, right? Like models are really just sort of a way of thinking the world. They're really like a thought, you know, they're, they're an idea and, and they're not permanent than in, in, in time and space, right? Like, so I think we need to constantly question and constantly evolve our models. And I think also the models really need to be driven by the questions that decision makers ask and by the and by sort of the insight that science can provide. So for example, to cite like to just to, to maybe I think you know provide another example from some of our work. We're working on ice sheet disintegration and sort of the impact of that on sea level rise, which I think is, you know, obviously a super important question. And we often get asked, you know, like, what is the sea level rise in 2050? And I, you know, by our partners, for example, right? And I understand that from a planning point of view, that is really why, what you might want to know, but it's just not what science can provide, right? Like, I think the main, like, I think the main contribution of science in that space is to highlight that we don't know. Like it, there's just a range of possibilities and it's a pretty wide range from a decision maker point of view. So, for example, in the San Francisco Bay Area where I live, that range is from three inches to three feet. And from a decision maker point of view, that's like almost zero to infinity, right? Mm -hmm. Because three feet in the Bay Area would mean, you know, like all of the or all of the airports would be permanently submerged and most of the streets would not be accessible. Like that would be like, you know, almost like apocalyptic, right? And three inches is like nothing. Right. So so I think that's what science can do, but it also can, I think, highlight. So I think the real value of what of the science that that is being done is the uncertainty. Right. It's like we don't know. So you better come up with a solution that sort of is centered on that insight. So whatever you do, don't assume certainty. Right. Like don't assume that, you know, and then design a solution that only works for that level of sea level rise, right? And I think it's a huge problem in how we currently plan for floods or how we manage flood risk. And, you know, like that was sort of, that came up already in the introduction of the talk. If you assume that you know, you're going to make yourself vulnerable for being wrong, right? So for example, if I build a seawall for millions of dollars that assumes, say, 12 inches of sea level rise, and then I get, I don't know, 18, right? Then all of the walls are overrun and I have all of the water trapped in the city and like things are going to get bad, right? So I think it's really important when we plan for risk or like just generally when we try to use science to solve a problem is to be very thoughtful about what is actually the key contribution of science and what is sort of the key scientific insight. And I think, for example, for the sea level rise point of view, I think the key scientific insight is that we don't know and we won't know for a while, in my opinion anyways. And I think it's important to come up with solutions that embrace that uncertainty rather than pretend that it doesn't exist. And Mark, again, so quoting Mark Bentley, who spoke about a year ago, he said, modeling for comfort is the biggest risk. So we want to build the sea level rise with something that prevent, prevents the sea level rise of 12 inches or, we want to drill that well here. We've already made the decision. We've already purchased, you know, signed the contract. Now we need a model that confirms yeah. essentially what the outcome that we want to have. There are lots of questions. It's a really sort of going on this philosophy and how we use the models properly. And we're sort of running out of time. I just want to pick one from David Brune. Apologies to, to all the other great questions that came up there that I, I couldn't answer them. We we'll sort of delve into that great discussion in more detail. I think there are a lot of excellent answers that you have given Jenny already. Thank you for this. Um, I want to close with David Bruin's model. And said, Would your model allow the coupling of probabilistic with deterministic approach, including varying physical properties of subsurface layers, 
units? Yeah, great question. And yes, we are. We have several models in which we couple the probabilistic and the deterministic element. I think this does to some degree, right? I mean, I think the quasi-static model of the earthquake rupture is really a deterministic model, right? Like we just run it in a probabilistic framework. Um, so I, yeah, I think, it, and I think there's great value in that. I think the question of whether we want to do that here is again really that of like, what does it gain? Like, what do you gain by doing that? I feel like always when you when you refine a model, the question is, what does a particular addition or improvement help you? Like, how does that help you like achieve your goal better than before, right? And I think to me, for this case, just given the uncertainty and all of the parameters, that is just inevitable when talking about subsurface reservoirs. To me, this model strikes a meaningful balance between sort of how much detail do we have in there and how much are we not showing or like not including. But yes, I think the in, the integration of deterministic and probabilistic is really powerful and something that we do a lot um, in, in most of our models, actually. So it's it's a excellent point to end on. Great, thank you. And, and as I said, no, excellent questions, a great talk. Thank you very much from my side for the great talk, for the great answers and discussion and to our audience for the many excellent questions that um, triggered that discussion. So um, with that, back to Hardy. Yes, thanks very of... much. Also, I wanted to mention that Jenny has given a very interesting TED talk on high purpose computing for natural disaster reduction. I have watched it before. So please do watch it because it's just for us, high performance computing is one thing, but it's very important and also was the key aspect of today talk as well about purpose for computing or modeling. So it's also very important. I would like to highlight it that uh, the audience please go and visit uh, that lecture as well and get in touch with her if you have mutual uh, research interest. So uh, I'd like to also uh, take the chance and introduce our next week uh, speaker. We are uh, going to host uh, Sophie Roman from University of Orleans in France. Uh, Sophie will uh, give a lecture next week about macrofluidics for geosciences and especially focused about a multi-phase and reactive transport in porous media. So until next week, uh, the same time, 4 p.m. Uh, Central European, 3 p.m. British time, 7 a.m. California. Uh, Jenny, in the case you were off very early, so you're most welcome. Next week, we meet again the same uh, location, Geoscience and Geoenergy webinar channel. Until then, uh, please stay happy and healthy and then tune in to our channel. Thanks once more, Jenny. It was a great talk. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you See you so next much. week. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.